Our text this evening comes again from Psalm 23. I invite you to turn there with me. Psalm 23, let's read together and hear the word of God. A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now this is the word of God, the word of our good shepherd, and we come this night to receive it as food for our souls. Let's pray and ask his blessing upon it. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that you are present with us as we gather to worship. Uh, We are thankful uh, that you have not forsaken us, but yet uh, continue with us. You have not left us alone, uh, but are very near unto us, and we thank you for this. And we pray that as we sit under your word together this evening, Uh, that you might bless it to us, that it might be food for our souls, that we might indeed feast as at a rich table spread before us, and that we might come away full and satisfied, having feasted on you the bread of life. This we ask, knowing that you do care for us, and hear our prayers. Amen. Hospitality, uh, that is the generous and friendly treatment of visitors and guests. That's kind of a basic definition of hospitality. A better definition, however, includes the heart. So we might say the quality or the disposition of receiving and treating guests in a warm, friendly, and generous way. You see the difference. There's a difference in the action that proceeds from the heart. And true hospitality is this. It comes from the heart. There is a disposition from which the actions flow. Hospitality has both practical and symbolic functions. Uh, The practical function has changed a lot in our modern world. We think about travel. Uh, We have an entire industry that is devoted to hospitality, to hosting people, to providing for them. Uh, In that way, things are somewhat different for, uh, for us today as we travel. You know, in ancient times, you would have been far more dependent upon receiving hospitality for safety, uh, having a place to stay, for caring for you, for your animals, for those traveling with you. Uh, But there is still this practical function that we understand. We care for others, we put them up, uh, we provide for them uh, in a variety of ways. But more than that, hospitality has a symbolic function. You see, to refuse someone hospitality, that is a significant statement. Uh, Maybe you've seen this, for example, in a Western movie. You know, the known bad guys riding up to the campfire. They know why he's there. They know what his aim is and that it's no good. And he's turned away, perhaps, by a show of force or refused hospitality. Scripture directs us as Christians to show hospitality as a normal function of life. However, it does prohibit hospitality to false teachers. We are not to entertain them. We are not to bid them Godspeed. This is because hospitality functions as a sign of communion, a sign of reception. We think of Christ uh, eating with sinners and tax collectors. We think of Christ washing the feet of his disciples. Those actions have theological significance. They go beyond uh, just what you see sort of on the surface. There's a, a real symbolic significance to those actions. Just like when Peter refused to eat with the Gentiles and was rebuked by Paul. You see, hospitality has a symbolic function. Christian hospitality functions as a reflection of Christ's reception of us. This is what Paul says. 
in Romans chapter 15 and 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For Christians, the practice of hospitality is shaped by the gracious character of Christ. Uh, he says, love one another. How? As I have loved you. Our hospitality, our welcoming of others is to be shaped by Christ. Psalm 23.5 is our text this evening. And this verse calls us to reflect upon the abundant grace of God in Christ. This grace flows from the person of Christ. Uh, and we see that the disposition of his heart is one of hospitality. The Lord is our host. The Lord is our host. We could, if we're thinking about breaking down this verse or maybe outlining it, uh, there are four parts to it. We see the provider, we see the opposition, the honored guest, and the abundant provision. The provider is the Lord. It is the Lord who is my shepherd. This same Lord is also my host. David, he's been reflecting upon the reality that the Lord is his shepherd. Now he sort of shifts the scene. Now he's thinking of the Lord as the master of a great feast, one who has spread his table before his guests. Christ is the channel through which all grace flows from God. How do we receive the grace of God? How do we receive good from the hand of God? Well, Christ is the channel. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. But Christ is not merely the channel, because the grace of Christ, or the grace of the Father, is not different than the grace of Christ. They are one and the same. They are one. We just read that in John 14. I and my Father are one. Now, Christ is the channel, yes, but he's not only the channel, because it is his grace that flows to us. The Son is one with the Father. Their will is one. Their mercy is one. And it is the Lord himself who prepares, or we might say makes ready the feast, sets the table. He does not leave his guests to fend for themselves. He extends the invitation, but he also makes ready. He also prepares. He also sets the table. You would think it's strange if you received a dinner invitation and your host opens the door and shows you to the kitchen and says, hey, have at it. That's not hospitality. That's not grace either, by the way. That's not the character of Christ. He doesn't extend an invitation only to leave you to make the preparations. It is the Lord himself who prepares the table. But we do see opposition. The table is spread in the presence of of the enemies. I think we're meant to see a reference to the kingship of Christ here. Uh, the Lord is our shepherd, but the Lord is also our king. Uh, we might think of Revelation, the lamb is our shepherd king. Our catechism asks in question 29, how does Christ execute the office of a king? Uh, there is both a reference to us, but also to our enemies. By subduing us to himself in ruling and defending us and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. The enemies are in the presence, or we are in the presence of them. This table is set before them, but they are restrained. As one commentator says, they are forced to witness my enjoyment without being able to disturb it. They're powerless to disturb the peace at this table. Although the enemies are here, you don't get the sense that this meal is eat, eaten in haste. You might think of soldiers as they are under the threat of an attack. Uh, it's, they're hungry. They might eat hastily to avoid being taken by surprise. But that's not, the, that's not the sense that you get as you read down through this psalm. The enemy is at the door, and yet at this table, there is peace. Now, the Christian can sit down as an honored guest. No hurry, no confusion and no disturbance. We see uh, this anointing, anointing of the head. This is a sign of honor and hospitality. You might think of Christ in Luke chapter 7, where he goes into the house of Simon the Pharisee, and 
Now the woman comes there and begins to anoint his feet. And amidst the protests, Christ rebukes the host. And he says, do you see this woman speaking to Simon? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet her feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time that I have come in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. And then he says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. So this is a sign of honor. It's a sign of hospitality. Now that anointing of the head, it, it has the idea of regarding with favor. Back in Psalm 20 and verse 3, uh, where prayers are offered for the success of the king, uh, says, may he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. That regard with favor, it's the same language that is used here, anointing of the head of this guest. It's, a, it's an honor. It's, it's a reception. It is one who is received, uh, not just kind of shuffled off to a dark corner in the house, but one who is received with honor and acknowledged. And I think that that shows us that there's a sense of vindication here. The enemies are restrained, but yet there's also an honored guest. Now, this brings to mind, perhaps, the judgment in Matthew 25. Uh, at the end of the age when Christ gathers all people, or when all people are gathered before Christ, the Son of Man sitting on his throne in judgment, separating the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And there Christ openly acknowledges his people. He openly vindicates them. I will confess before my Father the one who confesses me before men. Oil in Scripture is a sign of joy especially as it's used in this way, anointing of the head. This is a sign of joy and gladness. Uh, those who are redeemed by Christ are said to have everlasting joy or the oil of gladness upon their head. It's also a sign of unity. Psalm 133, as that oil is poured out on the head. Uh, those who receive the hospitality of Christ are those who are united to Christ. Uh, these things all go together. Uh, there's unity, there's joy. But this anointing also signifies an abundance. You know, it's not just a little dab of oil that's put on the head. No, it's an anointing. There's a running down of this. It's, it's an abundance that is meant to fill our minds. And this leads, of course, to the abundance of blessing there. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Well, the cup is your portion or your lot in life. Now, this has been... In Psalm 16 and Psalm 11, the portion or the cup of believers and unbelievers is spoken of in those places. It's your portion or your lot in life. And we see this abundance. Uh, this cup cannot contain all that is received. It just overflows. And the sense here is that the one at this table, the one who is an honored guest, his life is filled and overflowing with the good that he receives in, through, and from the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Christ spreads a table for his guests that is like no other. He provides all things that are necessary for life and godliness, all things needed for body and soul. And I think that we're meant to understand that this table encompasses both material and spiritual blessings. Uh, they're both present here. And I want us to think about these uh, uh, one after the other. Two observations, really, from the text. And the first is that the Lord provides all temporal things necessary to get us safely home. Uh, Psalm 84, 11, the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Those that seek first the kingdom of God not only receive the good their souls desire, but also what they need for their bodies. Psalm 23 is a pilgrim psalm. We see Christ shepherding his sheep to their eternal rest. And of course, the greatest Old Testament illustration of this is the, the nation of Israel brought out of Egypt through the wilderness and into Canaan. God's will for Israel was that they cross over Jordan to live life in Canaan with him, to dwell in communion with him in the promised land. Now for Christians, Crossing over Jordan is a synonym for death. Uh, many of our hymns speak of that. Now, this is just the way that we talk of the River Jordan. It's, it's a synonym for death. It pictures death for us. And 
like Christian and hopeful in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, we must cross over Jordan, just as they did, to enter our eternal rest in Christ. So it's a pilgrim psalm. Now, Jesus delivered a people out of Egypt, but he didn't just abandon them in the wilderness. There was a table spread for them in the wilderness. Now, as I said, the, the goal of the Exodus was Canaan. It was life with God. It was the spiritual reality that was held out for them, but that did not exclude the material things they needed in order to reach Canaan. In other words, the temporal blessings God provided for them in the wilderness so that they might reach their eternal rest, so that they might reach their intended rest with him. And temporal blessings have significance to believers for many reasons. Just to name three, it's because of their origin. We think often of God's common grace, and rightly so. Many people acknowledge the common grace of God, whether or not maybe they don't connect it to God himself, but they do acknowledge that God does provide. And we even acknowledge this in Scripture, that God is a good God, sends rain upon the just and the unjust. But as we reflect upon God's blessings, as we think about God's provisions as Christians, we rise higher than that because we recognize that all that we have comes to us from our Father in heaven. And they come to us from our Father in heaven because of our union with Christ. Christ says, my Father and your Father, my God and your God. There is a a, a relation, there is a common origin to the goods that we receive from God because of our common relation and union with Christ. So our, our blessings are significant because of their origin. They're significant because of our personal needs. We've already somewhat mentioned this, but just like Israel had their material needs cared for in the wilderness, so our Father provides for us. So we receive from the hand of our Lord, our Good Shepherd, what we need as we make our way to our heavenly home. But more than that, I want us to think about God's redemptive purpose in Christ. Why does God continue to preserve the world? Why does God provide for his creatures? Why does God provide in the ways that he does? Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Why is the gospel proclaimed through all the nations? So that all the elect may be brought in. So that all that Christ has died for, so that all of his sheep may be brought in. So there may be one fold, one flock under the one shepherd. The gospel must be proclaimed. There is an end in sight in God's plan, but it has not yet been reached. And Peter says in his second epistle that God's long-suffering is so that all the elect might reach repentance. God is not willing that any of the elect should perish, but that all should reach repentance. In other words, God is preserving creation for a higher purpose. God is preserving his creatures really with a redemptive purpose in mind. He continues to preserve his creation as it is now, not only to bring it to the consummation, but so that all the elect may be gathered in. The provision of our daily bread serves a greater purpose for us in that it it allows us to reach our end as individuals. We could think of the church corporately being brought to its end, but even the creation itself. God provides in light of and in view of this greater redemptive purpose. He preserves the world. And in this way, temporal blessings have great significance for us. We view the things that God gives us uh, through the lens of the children of God. We recognize they come to us from our Father. We recognize that they are necessary to bring us to our rest. But even more than that, God is preserving the world and providing for his creatures to bring about his redemptive purposes in Christ. You prepare a table before me, and my cup overflows. What can we learn from David? So what, we might ask. Well, David is a pattern for gratitude for us. 
David does not think of himself as a beggar scratching for crumbs at the Lord's table. No, my cup overflows. There is a great table that is spread before me. And we all have a cup allotted to us. We all have a portion. We all have a cup. Now that cup may be larger or smaller than the cup given to someone else. But we do all have a cup. We must acknowledge that. Now, the truth is that God does bless some with greater wealth than others. And there are several reasons that we could think about that. One is perhaps to show that godliness is not opposed to earthly greatness or comfort. Pastor Daniel mentioned this morning about suffering. Sometimes we get the idea that because we're suffering, that suffering in and of itself is some meritorious thing. But that's not the case. Godliness in and of itself is not opposed to comfort in life. And sometimes I think God blesses his children with wealth simply to demonstrate that. It's a testimony to God's own goodness and benevolence. It's to enable those so blessed to do greater good. Why does God give more to others in some cases? So that they can do greater good for his kingdom. Or perhaps so that they can serve God without distraction or without care. Well, these and many others, perhaps, are reasons that God blesses some with wealth. But the point is that God has given us all a portion. And David's perspective ought to be our own. And we see that David purposely calls to mind his overflowing cup. He's meditating on it. He's reflecting on it. And we ought to do that. Because the sweetness of mercies is lost if the heart is not thankful. The things that we receive, the blessings that we enjoy, the goodness of those things is lost if we are not grateful for them. And it's frequent acknowledgement of our blessings that induces us to gratitude, that makes our hearts more thankful. And the truth is we can never overthank the Lord. We can never thank God too much for what he's given to us. We grow in contentment by focusing on what we have received. We know this is true. When you stop to count your blessings, as the hymn says, it surprises us what God has done. Because it is not until we actually sometimes sit down and just begin to enumerate what God has given us that we realize how much we have. Now, complaining is our sort of native tongue. It doesn't matter what it is, we find something to complain about. But contentment grows by focusing on what we have received. And we are moved to greater love as we consider the love expressed to us. And that gratitude leads to obedience. The only obedience that counts is motivated by love. You want greater love that produces a, a, a disposition of obedience to Christ? Count your blessings. Gratitude stimulates love, and love leads to obedience. So we ought to give thanks. We ought to also say this, that we should use our gifts with self-control. Great mercies abused become great snares to our souls. When we abuse God's gifts, His goodness, what He's given us, it becomes a snare to our souls. And we know that Scripture tells us where much is given, much is required. The master of the house has gone away, but he is coming back, and we will give an account for what he's entrusted to us. And by the way, this is good for us to consider, because if we have less than others, we should not be envious of them, because we have less to give account of. Many who work hard all their lives just to get by have more comfort than those who have plenty. There is something to that. Now don't be envious if your cup is not the same as someone's el someone else's. Be content with what God has given you. Use it with self-control. But we should also say this, that we should enjoy the Lord's gifts. Because to neglect the use of God's gifts is a misuse of God's gifts. The Puritan Obadiah Sedgwick says this, It is a very curse when a man hath a dead heart under lively mercies, a great estate and no heart to use it. That yet he rejoiceth not all the days of his life, but is afraid to eat, and afraid to drink, 
and afraid to use any of God's blessings. He doth hereby injure the goodness of God in giving and injure the mercies themselves, which are given for our comfort. We ought to use the Lord's gifts. We ought to enjoy them. Properly and in their place, yes. But to neglect them is to misuse them. Ecclesiastes 5.19, Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them, this is the gift of God. We ought to enjoy the Lord's gifts. And a fourth, perhaps, application is that we ought to share our abundance. Another commentator says this, Those that have this happiness must carry their cup upright and see that it overflow into their poor brothers, poor brethren's emptier vessels. You know, the overflowing cup. It's not only for us. It's for our brothers and sisters as well. It's for the benefit of others. Getting back to that idea of hospitality and hosting. So there is a sense in which we can see a material blessing in this verse. But we do want to rise higher than that. Because we know that uh, the material things, the temporal things, they are passing away. We are on a journey to a, an everlasting home and an everlasting journey. And so we want to say also that the Lord's table, uh, here in 23.5, it is a gospel table. Uh, there is a sense in which there are material blessings in view here, and we can apply that and make uh, application to ourselves as to gratitude and how we use the gifts and sharing with our neighbors but we also do want to say that the Lord's table is a gospel table because Christ has a banqueting house over which the banner is love. The table in that house contains a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, Isaiah 25 and verse 6. You know, this verse is not referring to the marriage feast. You know, the life with God in heaven is, is often, or sometimes I should say, spoken of as that marriage supper. That's how it's pictured in Scripture. But that's not this, because we're still pilgrims. We're still traveling to the Lord's house. We're still in the valley of the shadow of death. The guests here at this table are on their way to their eternal home. Uh, this table is in the church, and it's found primarily in the ministry of the Word in the sacraments. As John Gill says, these, referring to the word in sacrament, these are for the entertainment of the faith of God's people. This is where Christ entertains his people. This is where uh, he feeds them. It is a gospel table, and it is a table at which the Lord is the host. You prepare a table for me. The host is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the eternal Son of God the one through whom and for whom all things were made, the one who took to himself our nature, our humanity, becoming like us that he might redeem us, the one who gave his life for the sheep. This is the one who sets the table. This is the table that is set before us. It is a gospel table. You cannot purchase your right to set at this table because it is all of grace. Though the truth is you and I deserve to be on the outside looking in like the enemies. We deserve to be on the outside looking in upon those feasting. We have no right in and of ourselves, no merit to approach to his table. It's only on his merits. It's only by his grace. And it is a feast that is for all people. The invitation is open to all. Christ has prepared a great banquet and invited many, sending out his servants, saying, Come, for everything is now ready. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He has no money. Come, buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's a gospel table. Do you sit at it this night? Do you sit with the Lord, feasting on the riches of his grace? The invitation is open. It is open to all who would come. You might protest, but Christ is a king. He's a person of high rank and high honor. Surely he would not have me at his table. Surely he would not invite me. What does Paul say? 
I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He heard the word of Christ. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Will you come to Christ's table this evening? Will you sit there with the Lord? It is prepared and ready. The invitation is open. You may enter and find life. Some of you take for granted the grace of Christ. The grace of Christ does not shock you. It does not amaze you. You hear the gospel week after week. You come, you sit under the word, and you leave with your heart unaffected by the magnitude of the grace that we have in Christ. The two evidences of a cold heart that I'll mention, the first is discontentment. Spurgeon says this, a man may be ever so wealthy, but if he is discontent, his cup cannot run over. If we're thinking of the spiritual blessings that Christ brings to us. Why is it that we find ourselves discontent with the blessings that Christ has brought by his grace? Well, you might be discontent simply because you're not a Christian. You do have to ask that question. If you're not content with what Christ provides, you're not content to feast on Christ, it may be because you've never truly tasted his grace. That is a reality. It might be because your heart has been drawn away from Christ. Perhaps you have come and tasted his grace and at one point rejoiced in it, but no longer because something has taken the place of Christ. You're no longer satisfied by what he feeds you. Your appetite is for something else, some other delight, some other fancy. Or perhaps you don't see your need. You've never cried out like the publican, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Or perhaps you think you've moved on from the gospel. We never outgrow the proclamation of the gospel. There is no point in our Christian life where we cease to be fed by the grace of Christ. This is what sustains us. This is what we feed on. It's Christ. We don't outgrow it. We don't move on to it. We don't eat some other bread of life. There is no other bread of life. It's Christ and Christ alone. But you may also be discontent because you think that Christ expects you to set the table. In other words, you have to earn your right. Now, the only garment fit for this table is the righteousness of Christ. There is no other garment that you can wear to this table but his righteousness. But discontent is an evidence of a cold heart that you take the grace of Christ for granted. But there's another evidence, and it's a lack of, excuse me, a lack of hospitality toward others. Now we opened by thinking about hospitality and the disposition of the heart. And that's important because true hospitality is more than a smile and a handshake. It's an open heart. Second Corinthians six. Paul says, writing to Corinth, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. Widen your heart also. The attitude and disposition of your heart says something about how you understand the gospel. Your disposition to others says something about how you understand the gospel, how you understand the welcome 
that Christ gives. We think of Corinth. It was this lack of hospitality that led them to corrupt the Lord's table. It was the fact that they refused to welcome one another as Christ welcomed them. Who is it that you need to open your heart to? Who is it that you need to open your heart to? Who do you need to welcome in this way as Christ has welcomed you? You see, the primary recipient of every act of Christian hospitality is Christ. I'll say that again. The primary recipient of every act of Christian hospitality is Christ. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 25. You did this to me, or you did not do this to me. Well, when, Lord? When you did it or not, to the least of these, my brethren. To welcome Christ's people is to welcome Christ, and to refuse Christ's people is to refuse Christ. Now, this is just a basic principle of ec Christian economics. This is how we think and live. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily. How? As unto the Lord, and not unto men. We understand that our actions don't exclude our brothers and sisters, but the primary recipient of what we do is Christ. We must have open hearts. We must welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us, made us honored guests, anointed our heads with oil, preparing a table for us, giving us this overflowing cup. We think of Peter there as the Lord washes his feet in his protest. Lord, no! Do you wash my feet? He's amazed. He's shocked by the fact that Christ would honor him in this way, that Christ would serve him this way. You should not be showing me hospitality, Lord. I should be the one serving you. Have you become used to the gospel, to the grace of God, to the hospitality of Christ? Some of you perhaps feel as though you've struggled in vain to find this table. You're in the valley. You've been struggling. You've been suffering. You've longed for communion with Christ. And like Mary at the tomb, you've wept and searched for your Savior. I want to remind you that looking for Christ in the valley is different from seeking to escape the valley. Those are different things. Because Christians find themselves content in the valley so long as Christ is near unto them. The heart that longs for Christ is content so long as Christ is near. And his table is readily prepared and close at hand. You prepare a table where? Before me. Before me. I'm not having to go find it somewhere, it's before me. Can you imagine Mary's relief when she realized it was the Lord who was before her? As she was there in the valley of the shadow of death, in a very real sense, looking, searching for the Master, only to find that he was right there before her. I will never leave you nor forsake you, and Christ is near to you. You're weary, you're laboring, you're longing to commune with Christ. He is near unto you. If you would only but lift your eyes, your eyes of faith, and see that he is there. Know that he is present. Know that he's got a place prepared for you. And there he will host you. The Lord is our host. The riches of his table are beyond estimation. You know, it would be like perhaps standing under a waterfall trying to fill a cup. There's just no way to contain that. There's no way to estimate the things that our Lord gives to us, both in this life and what is promised to us in the life to come. 
The psalmist asks in Psalm 116, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And may it be so for you and for me. Amen. Father, we give thanks for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your hospitality, for your benevolence, for your kindness. We have many, many good things, both material things, temporal things, in the unimaginable riches that we have received, spiritual blessings. We thank you for your grace. We pray that you would encourage us as we make our way to glory. Help us to be more thankful. Help us to use these things rightly. But please help us to rejoice, to know that you are near unto us, and in having your presence, we have all that we could hope, wish, or imagine for. We thank you for your grace. We ask that you might bless us and go with us, and with that, this word itself might go with us as a means of comfort, a means of challenging us, a means of helping us as we make our journey uh, to the other side of this valley in which we travel now. Amen. <clears throat>